I served in Iraq as a diplomat out on a forward operating base. And, you know, when we were engaged in missions there in Afghanistan as well, there were a whole lot of civilian casualties. It is unfortunately a feature of terrorism when uh, terrorist groups, whether it's Hamas, whether it is uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS, engage in these kind of uh, attacks and then uh, retreat into a civilian population, it does come at great cost. And I think that it is important to bear in mind that uh, a lot of that is because of the tactics that Hamas um, uses. What's your understanding about what is going on? We, we've had this pause in the fighting. Um, we've been told that both sides want to try to agree a further extension, but it's far from clear what's going to happen or, or even what the deadline is to agree a, a, former continu- a formal continuation. Well, this is part of the brinksmanship that has become a feature not only of the negotiations, but in fact of the implementation of some of these agreements. We've seen repeatedly accusations, particularly from Hamas saying that Israel was not uh, living up to certain uh, terms or the spirit of the deal in certain senses, and yet it ultimately was resolved. And I think in this case, there is a whole lot of international pressure on both sides right now to stay the course. So ultimately, I think we will see some resolution in the coming hours and that um, we will at least have uh, an extension of a couple days. Uh, But as your reports note, Prime Minister Netanyahu is pretty clearly indicating, signaling that he intends to take back up Uh, this mission of eradicating Hamas uh, from the Gaza Strip. Uh, And we'll come back to that in just a moment, Brett. But just uh, in the meantime, in the terms of these negotiations continuing, it does seem as though Israel is dependent on Hamas making commitments to release the hostages uh, if this uh, pause is to continue. Without question. And, uh, you know, up until now, Uh, The release uh, has only been of children, of uh, women. I think there are certainly a lot of observers, myself included, uh, that would argue that the fathers of some of these children who um, have been released ought to themselves be liberated to end uh, the psychological uh, cost, uh, the consequences that this uh, traumatic experience has imposed upon them. And that is just from a basic uh, humanitarian standpoint. Uh, Those obviously on both sides of this crisis are making claims about who is um, responsible for a greater humanitarian cost. But, you know, when you're holding uh, children, when you're holding uh, civilians who have nothing to do with uh, the uh, activities uh, of the military, I think it begs the question, um, obviously one of international law, but just of of basic um, human decency. And many of the papers here in the UK are featuring pictures of uh, the youngest hospital, uh, 10 month old Kafir Bibas, uh, who was killed, um, Hamas says it was killed by an Israeli airstrike, along with his four-year-old brother and his mother. So uh, for all the good news of more hostages being released, uh, we have to remember the huge jeopardy uh, that there is still for those that are being held and uh, a 10-month-old baby, a four-year-old and their mother are all apparently killed. And those uh, reports are equally tragic and ought to both be investigated and and their lives mourned and and a resolution uh, to try and uh, limit to the extent uh, that is possible uh, civilian costs and casualties as part of this conflict. But Carol, I think it's also important for us. uh, I served in Iraq as a diplomat out on a forward operating base and you know when we were engaged in missions there in Afghanistan as well, there were a whole lot of civilian casualties. It is unfortunately a feature of terrorism when uh, terrorist groups, whether it's Hamas, whether it is uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS, engage in these kind of 
uh, attacks and then uh, retreat into a civilian population, it does come at great cost. And I think that it is important to bear in mind that Uh, A lot of that is because of the tactics that Hamas um, uses. How difficult is it going to be for Israel to resume this military operation? It does seem intent on doing so, um, whether that is tomorrow or perhaps in another day or two. Um, We have seen this pause. Uh, It has allowed Palestinians, uh, at least in some cases, to bury their loved ones, uh, to get at least some humanitarian supplies. Uh, Do you think that Israel is going to face further international pressure if, as it has vowed to do, um, it does, uh, in the next few days, resume that military operation, which is going to lead to, as you've pointed out, um, further civilian casualties? You know what's interesting, Carol? As somebody who has spent decades in diplomacy, it comes down to what credibility, what currency countries have Unfortunately, a lot of the countries that could affect a change in the political calculations of Israel have already played their cards, and they've played them in an aggressive way against Israel. So I think it becomes more difficult for a lot of those even you know recent um, partners in the region that established uh, a normalization of relations with Israel or European nations who um, obviously have uh, come out with uh, quite a a great deal of criticism of what Israel's done. So if they simply revert to that same level of criticism, Israel is already calculating that into the decisions that they're making versus I think it's important for leaders, particularly in Europe as well as in the region, to look at how do we bring Israel towards a place where we have an internationally acceptable resolution of this crisis. And ultimately, I think that ought to be our objective, but it doesn't mean that we simply call a ceasefire and a terrorist organization is allowed to continue to build up that capacity to attack civilians, as we saw on October 7th. And we know that the U.S. has been very involved in this whole process. Uh, President Biden has make it, made it clear publicly that he has been putting pressure on uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Israeli government uh, to exercise greater restraint uh, as it carries out these military operations. And we here in Washington certainly are imparting that, particularly, I think, in private conversations. But you have, in the last few days, seen more of those public comments about uh, one conditioning of additional American aid to certain um, standards or to certain uh, acts uh, that the Israelis would have to comply with. I think, additionally, um, the U.S. has also obviously uh, sought to leverage its influence not only with Israel, but with some of our Arab partners. Uh, You've seen Qatar play uh, a key role in the resolution of this um, hostage uh, crisis. But at the same time, I think we've got to account for the fact that you know, the chorus of calls for a ceasefire have got to do more than simply uh, shout Uh, louder at Israel, stop firing. They've got to figure out a solution for the threat that still is very much clear and present for Israeli civilians. And nobody seems to have a a solution in terms of some form of diplomatic initiative. That seems to be so far off the agenda. The Israelis are still simply talking about destroying Hamas, which um, is going to be a very, very difficult objective to achieve for all the reasons that you've outlined. I mean, is there any sense in the US of of where there can possibly be some form of future accommodation um, if Israel does even reach a point that it believes it's done enough um, to to end the threat from Hamas? So I don't think the solution is that far off, Carol. Uh, We have a playbook for this, which would be for an international force, whether it is um, uh, made up of Arab nations or international uh, peacekeepers with the blue helmets of the United Nations, 
to uh, go in and um, to effectively uh, administer Gaza to ensure that Hamas was not rearming itself, uh, developing uh, an enhanced terrorist capability. And that would also satisfy Israel on a security level. But at the same time, it would ensure that we're not going back to a a point where Gaza is occupied by Israeli forces. I think that's the kind of solution that we ought to be driving towards in the coming days and weeks. And is it even possible, do you think, for Israel to get close to achieving that objective of destroying Hamas? I think through uh, the same kind of campaigns, you know, you'll uh, again, remember what we, uh, we the U.S., along with um, British forces, achieved in Mosul, what we achieved in Tikrit, what we achieved in large parts of uh, Iraq, not just once, but twice. And yes, it is possible to, um, to a large extent, remove that terrorist threat to dismantle their network. Uh, Certainly a lot of uh, the weapons, um, these missiles that continue uh, to be fired in barrages towards uh, Israel without regard to where they will land, which is a a clear difference between what uh, Israel uh, is doing. So there is a way, uh, there is a, a precedent for this. And I think those of us who are uh, sitting outside of this conflict have a responsibility to ensure that we're not simply um, laying blame. And we've seen an extraordinary rise both in anti-Semitic attacks as well as um, Islamophobia. And and there were some startling statistics I saw recently in the Mm -hmm. UK as well as here in the US. We have got to Uh, expect amongst our leaders that we are not simply adding more fuel to the fire and the fury of um, conversation around this, but working in a constructive way to figure out how we get past this present um, uh, dark period in in the world. Brett Bruin, uh, president of the Global Situation Room, uh, former White House Global Engagement Director.